Hello. Welcome. Uh, my name is Georgia Court, and I'm welcoming you to today's event, which is entitled A Zoom Haunted Book Launch and Virtual Tarot Salon. I think that implies there might be some fun, maybe a little bit of spookiness, who knows what's going to happen yet. But a couple orders of, of business uh, before we get started. Uh, Emily Carr, who is one of the principals on this uh, Zoom event, <clears throat> has a brand new book out. That would be the book when we say launch, okay? The title of the book is Name Your Bird Without a Gun. And if you look in the chat, the very first entry, you may have to scroll up because some chatting has been going on. At the very first entry, there is a link where you can go to bookstore number one to purchase that book. So that's that's right there for you. My name is Georgia Court. I'm the proprietor of bookstore one. And I'm having a lot of fun this COVID season, actually hosting Zoom events, believe it or not. So it, it is it's fun for me. Now, as this goes along, um, put your comments, your questions in the chat, uh, because those will be monitored throughout the presentation. And uh, that's how people will know if you have questions and, and we will be able to engage with you. Right now, I'm going to introduce uh, our principals. Then I'm gonna turn it over to them and actually, I'm going to ask them as I introduce them to unmute themselves. All of the rest of you are muted. No offense. It's just that I realize from experience that in the background, little kitty cats meow. I see I, a doggies bark. I see one in, in Helene's lap right now, for example. And things happen. So that's that's why I keep you. Uh, I, I keep it muted. You know, unless things change because because Avni or Emily or Nick would like to do something different later. But in any case, uh, Emily, could you unmute yourself? Emily Carr is a tarot storyteller, ransom artist, divorce poet, and echo feminist teacher. After she got an MFA in poetry from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, she took a doctorate in echo poetics at the University of Calgary. These days, she is assistant professor of creative writing at New College of Florida. Her McSweeney's collection, Whosoever Has Let a Minotaur Enter Them or a Sonnet, inspired a beer of the same name brewed at the Ale Apothecary in Bend, Oregon. Emily's tarot romance, Name Your Bird Without a Gun, is now available, as I said, from Bookstore One. And don't forget the link in the chat. Okay, Emily has published essays in storytelling and the Tarot in American Poetry Review and the Writer's Chronicle. So welcome, Emily Carr. Thank you, I'm so delighted to be here. And to yeah. see you all, all y'all Ben folks out there. It's so good to see you. <laughs> That's, oh, so we have long distance people. So it meant something to put Eastern time in the title today. This is a good thing. That's because yeah. I don't know what time it is actually anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Now I'm going to introduce Avni uh, Vias. Avni, please uh, unmute yourself. Avni, Hi, everyone. Avni is a poet and co-author of Candy in Our Brains. Avni is also the essays editor for Honey Literary. Her work has been published in journals such as Meridian, Grist, The Pinch, Rigorous, Mag, Juked, and others. She teaches in the writing program at New College of Florida. I'd also like to introduce and ask to unmute Nick Clarkson. Dr. Nick Clarkson is an assistant professor of gender studies. Can you unmute yourself, Nick, or do I need to do that? Okay, let me... Let me invite Nick to unmute. Let me find you in the in the list. I know you're here because I can see you. No, Nick Clarkson. Okay, there you go. Okay, hello. Believe it or not, I have more than one Nick on this list. Okay, there we are. Okay, 
Dr. Nick Clarkson is an assistant professor of gender studies at New College of Florida, a budding creative writer and a multidisciplinary woo aficionado. He is working on a creative nonfiction book examining the relationship between trans and non-trans gay masculinities to illustrate possibilities for healing from the ordinary traumas of homophobia and transphobia. He regularly consults the tarot and the stars for healing and writing guidance. Please welcome Nick, Avni, and Emily. I will turn it over to them. I will see you at the very end to wish you bon voyage, but for now, I'm going to sit back and enjoy as well. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Georgia. Um, before I start reading some poetry for y'all, there's just three things I wanted to say. The first is to start with um, some gratitude, uh, to thank the folks at Bookstore One, Georgia, Andrea, John, for making this possible, for hosting this event. Many of y'all are teachers out there, so you, you're well aware that we're like always doing the tech, sometimes even for our students, and it's such a gift not to be doing the tech today to just be showing up and sharing some poetry. So big thanks to Bookstore One. Um, those of y'all who are local, my book is on the shelves next to like some really famous authors. So you should go down and check that out. It's uh, amazing even to my own self. I also wanted to thank my new colleagues here at the New College of Florida, Avni and Nick, um, for being my special guests and joining me in this conversation. Uh, I want to thank all of y'all for zooming in. Many of y'all are zooming in from various parts of the country, even internationally. So thank you for making space for poetry, for tarot, for me, for my book um, in your day today. Uh, when I was, um, when I released my last book, my McSweeney's collection, I was joking that I don't do book tours because I'm done doing readings full of strangers, which is not to say that I don't appreciate strangers, but I was just like, I will only do a reading where there's at least one person in the audience that I know and love and then carefully scheme to make that happen. Uh, so, you know, I'm not happy about COVID-19, but I am happy that we're all familiar enough with virtual events that some of y'all are like clocked in at work while online. Some of y'all are while in this event. Some of y'all are watching toddlers while you're here. So thank you, much gratitude. Um, I also want to thank the spirits who are joining us today. As y'all know, um, we're on the verge of Samhain, Halloween, other names for the holiday we're about to um, celebrate. The veil between the worlds is thinnest at this moment. Um, so the spirit world is close. Ghost ancestors are, are close to us. And I have three um, spirits that I wanted to thank for, for being here today. I kind of think of this as like the unholy trinity that's presiding over um, what's to follow. So the first is Jacqueline Lamba, Andre Breton's ex-wife, who was a great painter in her own right. And we'll come back to her later because I'm assuming that most of y'all, unless you've heard me gushing about her lately, you probably haven't heard of her. Uh, also the ghost of my grandfather as a young man. The ghost of my grandfather as a young man started visiting me 15 years ago when I was an MFA student. This was before he died. He died as an old man a couple years after uh, his ghost as a young man started visiting me. Because I'm a poet, this was not at all confusing to me. In fact, it probably would have been confusing to me if he visited as an old man after he died. So um, he's been a part of my life, his ghost has been a, a part of my life for about 15 years. And most recently he's been, he had a, a red Toyota Tacoma that he bought himself when he retired and he drove around golfing and gardening in this red Toyota Tacoma. Uh, lately he's been visiting me in my dreams. Uh, and I like to think that like when I get in that Toyota he's ferrying me away from my anxiety I haven't yet figured out where we're headed. I'm still gotta fill in that part of the adventure, but it's um, delightful for me. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third ghost who's, who's here with me today is Kurt Kavitli. He is, was my dad's best friend. Uh, I knew him since I was five. He was a big part of my life. I babysat his kids all through high school and college. He was one of my number one super fans since I was a teenager. Uh, and he died of mesothelioma, the really terrible asbestos cancer on Wednesday. So he is newly on the other side of the veil and I especially wanted to invite Kirk to join us today um, and to honor 
honor his spirit. Uh, so as we spend a minute of silence uh, for Kirk, I want you to also think about inviting your own spirits to accompany you on our journey over the next hour or so. That was the first thing. The second thing is much lighter. Uh, in my mind, I'm actually wearing a Halloween costume right now. And maybe five minutes before the event, I figured out what the costume was. So uh, free giveaway of a co signed copy of my book at the end, if you can figure out what I think my costume is. I have a long history of wearing Halloween costumes that no one else recognizes except for me. Um, so you'll have to use your imaginations. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, for those of y'all who aren't familiar with my book, I call it a tarot romance um, because I worked with the structure of the tarot extensively while writing it. Uh, there are 78 poems slash scenes that comprise the book, 78 tarot cards, so one poem or scene for each of the cards in the deck. Uh, it's not, the, the deck is not in order, right? It's like I very intentionally shuffled it. Um, so what I'm gonna be doing this evening is reading from the suit of wands. Uh, so I'm gonna put in the chat, the page numbers that I'm reading from. I can see some of y'all have copies of my book out there, which is totally rad. Um, so if you wanna follow along, that's totally up to you. I put the page numbers in the chat. And those three things said, I will read from Name Your Bird Without a Gun, a tarot romance. Queen for a day, the four of wands reversed. Brass couplets drift across concrete, succumb to shattered simile, relieved only by the bend of her knee, an elbow resting on tombstone. The wings of her hip bones line up without comment, her wet fingers spoon salt. She is Cassiopeia, weeping on a day without gods. Her husband is dead, or he has disappeared. He has left no note. He will be met by no one. There is no one to save him. Cheat lightning slumbers lightly, ruffles, swells increases the trees. She follows. She walks or is carried a long way across sand dunes and then the river swallowing grass. She was born in July, but now she feels like January. Alone and unannounced, liberty is a contraction in the clouds. Down hand over hand from the moon on a rope, she turns her head and cannot see the children in the trees. With a blank mind, she licks her fingers. Poor driftwood, poor bird, rose to bone to air in that shrug of star. And say jure, yes, another dumb animal making that final leap. A page straight from God's plan, the eight of wands reversed. Liberty hangs laundry briskly shaken between buckeyes. Knocks half inches of strawberry wine cooler back like whiskey. Knowing it won't do any good, carves his initials in buckeye. Like Midas, she thinks, touching his daughter, roses, servants, the water and fountain. Liberty lies with the Bible on her stomach and falls asleep with all the lights on.
lateral gene exchange, the ace of wands. Liberty puts her wedding ring in a band-aid box, her sundress flowers sideways. Sin and shadow run over the flat heaven of her belly, combing your limbs. Cattails ripple, fatten. Somewhere, the desperate sound of crickets greasing their pronouns. Her hunger breaks, zero at the bone. All distance, all breath. Inside that startled space, your hands like hot salt. Jesus, she cries, how does a body do? She's becoming someone else, not the person she wanted to be, like Madame Bovary sitting down with a pen and the notion of Flaubert says moi. Pathetic Crusoe, the Page of Wands. Her silhouette gathers up hair her breasts drop their fruit, a nipple shines through. Stop, you think, stop right there. This isn't, you think, what I was asking for. This isn't what I was asking for. But already in four o'clock delirium, she undresses completely. And for the first time, you see her naked. Her ribs bare as she pulls the tea over her head, hips curving as she removes her panties. It's four o'clock and Liberty counts back from 10. You run your fingers along the line between tanned and virgin. Nothing but nothing could have stopped you. Squaring the circle, the two of wands. Hydrogen and oxygen fall through trees, fat clouds and strange light bulbs, fish shaped like tattered stars, iridescent bacteria in the sediment of letters, cumulus boil, church bell come again in wet speech. On a wooden deck over water, liberty is some kind of beautiful accident like wild lilacs smoldering in the short grass. Rilke's angels dangle from her ears. In lip gloss, no bra, and a blue dress with finches, she is reading the lives of the saints, dying men pierced by arrows, and women staring at the white leopards of heaven as flames lick their breasts. She likes the ornately lettered names, the early paragraphs yawning with martyrs, waiting to be tempted. Listen, choice matters exactly as much as it doesn't. Why? I don't know, but you feel it happening. There is no death like this except, if you remember it, your baptism. Facts sown with stars, the three of wands. Did you know then that love is a terror? whose outcome we don't fear. We go through the terror from beginning to end, and that precisely is love at first sight. A terror about which you know more than the beginning, a terror in which you feel confidence. There are crickets. There is corn pimped end by corn, eggs hatched by the wind, the area calculus under the little torch of a love letter, gravity, a future you must overcome. Does it feel like that? Absolutely. Earth to cloud, girl to bird, a blue halo leaving a clear space above. Liberty moves in it as a fish. Easy does it, the seven of wands. In my plan to be myself, Liberty says, I became someone else. Her earrings swing over the abysses of slender tulips. You are in a cafe on the water. The sun shimmies up the shin of a ditch. Dogwood's fishtail, an exhausted cloud sheds pale oxygen. Like the frog, she says, 
made beautiful on its own amphibian terms. She uncrosses, recrosses her legs. Yes, as the sea watched Icarus fly off a tree. Just to you, she speaks this way. From above and to the right, watching herself as only another could have forgotten. On her menu, you draw Noah's Ark in black and white, thinking the boat inside the ribs of which a remnant of terrestrial life could survive. To be seen as a wife did not, Liberty says, make me feel like one. It is as if her marriage hadn't quite happened to her, but nearby, like car accidents or rain. The terrifying thing, she says, is that it is done. Not what you have done, but that it is over. Constitutional Bagatelle, the Queen of Wands, reversed. Through dramatic climax of wet window, the wind says, huh. Dogs of early evening squabble. The ragged pulse of church bells is pulled into sky. Liberty unbundles her ribs, sheds her bark, and shines. Tender, cunningly, make love, make me. Brake lights flower, helicopters lament. Her thighs happen. Uninvited, they arrive. In honor of a beauty that owes us nothing. A lacy bra with violent flowers. The melody running away with your wrists. A cathedral making tribute to that which does not exist. Like snowflakes falling inside the globe of Mozart's holy heaven. Why did God make us love? because God loves stories, steepling the sky with his fish. If one loves, then immediately one also admires, fears, and defends. So much for love. At some point, you will have to admit you have passed the point of no return. You are hurtling towards a future even liberty can't imagine. And all around you, your intent runs backwards. Grace notes falling off to rendezvous with her faith or trust, or is that word sex? Messiah on parole, the nine of wands reversed. Chihuahuas ruin the sidewalk, pee on oak leaves. Girl Scouts share secrets on the asphalt. The truth hums, the truth trembles. The truth holds. What do you want? You ought to make up your mind. Or do you believe liberty has no plot? Even this was taken from her, as all lies are. She is drinking pink champagne from a thermos with a logo that looks like a dream catcher inside the belly of a crow. She is looking for permission to arrange her limbs easily in the orchestration of salaries, weddings, and garages. This shouldn't be a problem, but it is. There is, for example, what is unforgivable and what comes after. Small mammals fighting in the sky. Tiny and expensive dusk begins to stretch through the trees. It is as if you have stepped sideways into a dimension where desire never stops its course, where having come to this predicament, there is only the uncertainty of all purpose. Reproductive physics, the king of wands. Beside her, you're awake. Your mind turns on itself in black fish-like rain. You run your fingers over that pale seal branded across her wrists for the love of a distant and different man who disappeared. I need, you think, the truth and some aspirin. You take her hand, light and cold, go running through your limbs. The moon squeezes herself through gargoyle clouds, the echo of someone else's television. From the inside out, pretend. There is no story yet, only raw elements. You had cheated, you would cheat. After this, a happy ending seems unnecessary.
Hosanna, the Ten of Wands. You have had your go at love, and now she is gentle, distant, and dreaming backwards. With its tiny hand and charred heart, the clock comes, 2.30. Did I? Did I? Your hand slips a warm shadow across her beautiful hair, small high buttocks, sighs. Without their violins, cicadas head for the woods, little bracelets of fact, practice, yes, no. You never asked, would she? Liberty never said she would. Birds fly across her exposed chest and down one arm, a black decrescendo. The house cat, wordless, looks up and sees through you. Don't trust anybody. You never have, you never will. This would make a good ending, you think, but you go on living, of course. Straight, no chaser, the Knight of Wands reversed. Picture Liberty spinning so fast that, like the blades of an electric fan, her arms disappear. Every story has a tense, it must take place in time. Yet there are ways to elide these laws. So neither of you, for example, knows the complete truth. Only one of you knows a section, one of you another, but to the whole picture, only I am invited. Party of the Flame, the Five of Wands. In the creamy white jag, there are two witnesses. Liberty walks smack against the car and doesn't scream, superimposed on headlights. She is paralyzed, beautiful, accurate. Her red skirt slides up her thighs, her mouth falls open. She flips over twice, rights herself, skids back on the macadam, breathes. Oxygen and hydrogen swerve around her like a parlor trick. An injured blue jay drags itself to the sidewalk, stands back and wait for the ricochet. Parting with a lower case, the six of wands reversed. A paper scrap wobbles on the windowsill. You cut and paste, bones, swords, spiders. Black butterflies shift and flap. Meanwhile, on the television, there are girl guides, dying baby turtles, tarantulas in harness, a fleet of ships, miniature horses, and Vietnamese pot-bellied pigs. A semi rumbles towards the Midwestern plains. Flames stream across the screen like hair. Do you want to believe she wanted to live? Did you want her to survive? Thank you. So that's not where the book ends, obviously, but I, I kind of like that that's where the suit of wands ends and where this reading ends um, with some very intense questions. Uh, also, for those of y'all who are following along, page 32, yeah, that was just a little like tricky joke there, huh? Um, okay, so thank you. That's the suit of wands. And what we're going to do now is um, talk tarot, talk haunting, self-haunting, talk about the Queen of Wands, talk about poetics. Uh, and we encourage y'all to engage with us and chat. Again, we're saving time for um, y'all to, to like talk, right, for a Q&A later. So please um, share your thoughts as you have them and your questions. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do was just talk a little bit about the story behind this book. Uh, this book is very much a happy accident. I had run away from everything I knew, which would have been a PhD program in Canada, 
um, and a man I'd been married to for many years and landed in 2010 in the Jack Kerouac house in Orlando, Florida. And I had a um, negative sense of direction. It was amazing. It was probably the most beautiful summer of my entire life for that reason. Uh, and a friend mailed me a care package, which included uh, Elvis magnets, a crazy cat lady figurine, uh, like owl made out of pottery, some tarot cards. At the time, I thought I would be writing a choose your own adventure murder mystery because, you know, I, I can't do a simple thing. Uh, and I had no idea what I, was, what I was doing. So the tarot showed up. That was a very happy accident. And um, what I found was that the tarot has this intentional, resilient, but also flexible structure um, that, that's a really kind of beautiful space for the poetic mind to inhabit. Um, and I'm inspired in my relationship uh, to the tarot by Alice Notley, who I feel like many of us would agree is the living witch, right, of contemporary poetry. Um, or if there is a living witch of contemporary poetry, then she is it. Uh, so this is what she has to say about the tarot. I'm not an expert on the deck at all, my interest lies somewhere near a sense that words are like tarot cards and that a poem manipulates unpredictable depths with words. I like the tarot because it works like poetry and because you don't really have to believe in anything. It's there to be used. The symbols are remarkably durable and beautiful. They float out to encompass all kinds of meanings. I really like that phrase, the symbols are remarkably durable and beautiful. Um, that's my experience of the tarot. The tarot has been with me now for 10 years um, and I certainly didn't expect that it would be such a, a like, I guess essential really part of my life. Um, and so as I've been living with the tarot for 10 years, I think that it's a really generous text, a text that makes a lot of space that does in fact invite you to choose your own adventure. And so we're gonna embark on one of those choose your own adventures that the tarot uh, affords or invites us into you right now with the Queen of Wands. So it was promised that this would be a haunted book launch. I did invite some spirits at the beginning. Um, the Queen of Wands is, also, is often by many tarot readers considered to be the witch of the tarot. Uh, she does have a wand and in traditional depictions of the card, she's also got a black cat. So it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, I've been spending a lot of time with the court cards this summer and I've created my own framework to help me think through uh, the queens, right? So there are four suits in the tarot, the cups, the wands, the swords, and the pentacles, and there's court cards for all of them. So as I think about the queens, I think that the queen of cups knows love and connection. According to Bust, she's emotionally intelligent. Bust Magazine, that is. I thought you would like to have my thoughts and then like popular thoughts, let's say. Uh, the Queen of Swords, I like to think that the Queen of Swords knows boundaries and sorrow. According to Bust Magazine, she's mentally clear. The Queen of Pentacles knows work and work, in my opinion. According to Bust, she's very independent. And then finally, I like to think that the Queen of Wands knows true independence of mind no matter what came before. And to me, that is very witchy. Again, all of that's very important, right? Not just true independence of mind, but also the no matter what came before part. Uh, to me, that's witchy. According to Bust, that's badass. So there are lots of ways to define witch, and I really don't want to get into the weeds with labels there. But again, I would argue that if anyone knows true independence of mind, no matter what came before, that would be the witch of the tarot. Um, also, the, the Queen of Wands is, I mean, she's got that wand, right? And wands receive. So she's also known for being skilled at receiving, um, which is of course like witchy, right? And just gonna list a few other ways that I see the Queen of Wands as a witch before I turn it over to y'all. So pay attention, because it's gonna be your turn next. The Queen of Wands is the queen most likely to be misunderstood, even and especially by her own self. She's the queen who never ceases being wary of herself or others. In fact, people should be more wary of her than they know how to be. The queen of wands is a terrifyingly staunch friend. Y'all all have one of those, right? I feel like we all need one. And then if you don't have one, you need to run out and get one. I can see some of mine out there, as a matter of fact. It's great to see y'all. 
Uh, the Queen of Wands is self-sufficient. She creates her own reality, which is of course very witchy. She's also the kind of person you don't want to let down. Finally, she's utterly enchanting, a work of art in her person. All right, so with those things in mind, as I've been working with the court cards over, I guess it's not, it's still summer here in Florida, so I'm just gonna say over the summer. So as I've been working with the court cards, um, I've been creating sparks for each card. So it's like, I can kind of like hold the card in my mind. Um, I can personalize it in a way that resonates with me in this particular historical moment. Um, and I'm gonna share those sparks with you so you can think alongside us as I invite Nick and Omni into the conversation. As I do so, keep in mind that, um, you know, these, these sparks were written by someone who's dedicated her life to interrogating herself on the page um, and is very committed to writing, imagining her way through experiences that we as women in particular have been told that we should be ashamed of and be silent about, right? So I have um, committed myself to speaking, writing about abortion, suicide, you know, divorce, all kinds of issues that, that there's a lot. I feel like the things I write about either they're silence or ideologically charged noise. And I want to offer um, a third term. So um, just, and also like to my dismay as I'm doing this, I've been praised for being vulnerable. And I don't really like that because I think vulnerable is a buzzword. And most of the people who use it don't really know what it's like to be vulnerable. Like most of the time I feel like people who are praising me for vulnerability haven't really experienced vulnerability. And that's why they're able to like say that as a compliment. I prefer negative capability, open to certificates and compliments in that area. Um, so just like a heads up that these provocations, like if you're used to a soft touch from um, you know your therapist, these provocations are like the 500 level version, okay? Um, but we gotcha and you don't have to share anything. So I'm putting the file in the chat for those of y'all who want to download it and have it. We have lots of gifts for y'all this evening because you have given us the gift of your time, energy, and attention. I'm also now sharing my screen so we can look at these uh, together. So... I won't be able to see the chat or anything else for a minute. So just so you know. Okay, so I'm using the word spark intentionally here. Of course, Anne Carson, who's a legend amongst us poets says that if prose is a house, then poetry is a woman running through a house on fire. Um, and I do think that sometimes it helps to run through your mind as if it were on fire. Uh, these sparks are designed to catalyze that kind of thinking. Uh, so as we go through them, what I want you to do is just pick one spark that you can carry with you. Um, so, you know, you have a, a, like a personal reason for listening, basically. Um, so again, we're not going to ask you to like answer these. These are just a lens for listening and um, engaging. Okay, so prompt number one. The self-help books urged you to be yourself. And yet, as it turned out, being yourself was the crime to end all crimes. Two, a massacre is when everything you don't like about yourself wins. Obviously, I am thinking in the shadow side of the Queen of Wands. And finally, three, what are the stories that tell you even as you refuse to receive them? You're probably gonna hear what are the stories that you tell even as you refuse to receive them because we're very egotistical as human beings and we also don't pay attention to words. So as a matter of fact, this prompt reads, what are the stories that tell you even as you refuse to receive them? Um, so we're gonna talk some, but I'm gonna like, we're gonna have like a minute or two of silence so you can sort of like pick a prompt that resonates with you. Um, so, you know, you can sort of like have your, imagination activated, um, as opposed to passively consuming what's happening next. And I see there's something in the chat that- Emily, I have a question. Oh, the screen didn't change. Yeah, is it possible to um, show all of the sparks at once? I'm not sure. I think that yeah, was the question. Yeah, totally possible. Hang on. Let Thank me... you, Amelia, for asking. Well, 
I might be able to share. Well, yeah, I think I can. They're going to be small though, but well, and you'll also see a traditional depiction of the Queen of Wands, so that might be perfect. Okay, hang on. That. Yeah, I think we can see the text for each of them. That works. So if you found those prompts or those sparks a little bit scary, yes, it's terrifying to be inside my mind, um, but also delightful at the same time. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Avni and Nick. Uh, Avni is going to talk about some ways to receive these provocations, and Nick's going to make a bridge between the provocations and the Queen of Wands. Emily, when you were talking about um, the, vul the vulnerable word, uh, the V word, as it were. Uh, I think um, it was it was funny. I was talking about this today with a student, uh, and I what one of the challenges with the vulnerable word, right, is uh, kind of what makes it, what sort of frames it is its etymology in Latin. Word vulnerable comes from the word for wound, and there's this interesting play where when we're vulnerable, we're like working with our wound plus its makeshift armor. And so I was really interested in kind of that play where um, the presence of vulnerability kind of is the center of what's holding, but it's also uh, part of how it's presented as um, the way that it would like to reveal itself. I found that really compelling. Um, when I was looking over these provocations, I think, uh, I don't know how y'all receive them. If y'all have comments in chat, I would love to read them. Um, I was thinking about the second one, the massacre is when everything you don't like about yourself wins. I was thinking about um, this unbearable talent that I have. Um, I'm so good at leaving dishes in the sink. Like, so I'm so talented at this one specific thing. Um, and I'm starting to just embrace it as a superpower. My procrastination, I think, is, is gonna be my um, queen of wands energy that I'm gonna carry forward. So um, I don't know, I'm gonna take that in a more playful way. Nick, do you want to talk about uh, the Queen of Wands as you understand, or as you receive the card? Okay, I think I made it now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think like often when Emily and I talk about tarot, um, I feel like Emily's approach is kind of to like take a spark from the tarot and run off in some sort of poetic direction. And I'm like, wait, how does that relate to how I think about this card and its usual sort of tarot instances? Um, it's been really helpful for me because it's helping me think in a more creative, uh, less kind of rigidly structured sort of way. Um, but I think like when when the Queen of Wands comes up for me in like a, a daily draw or something like that, um, I feel like it's often speaking to like, uh, what's my most vibrant kind of single lady self? Um, and so I guess like part of what I was hearing in this provocation of um, the self-help books urged you to be yourself and yet as it turned out being yourself was the crime to end all crimes. Um, I think like especially thinking about the kinds of things Emily was saying about um, like thinking about these prompts through the experiences of women in particular. Um, what are the ways that your vibrant single lady self has been 
uh, repressed or sort of hidden by various kinds of things um, or is received as a crime or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's sort of what I'm thinking about. Like, what are what are all of the kind of layers of conditioning and messages that I've received about like being too much or like being wrong in some particular way that has dampened or dimmed my most vibrant uh, single lady self. I feel like there's some connection there between the vibrant single lady self and not doing the dishes that perhaps the most mundane way she gets dimmed is by needing to do the dishes. <laughs> um, and I also like how y'all have like a, a sort of like practical, like everyday, right? Um, kind of way of thinking about the card and then also something that's um, uh, a little bit more like metaphysical or existential because of course the, the, the tarot is open to that, right? To, um, to it sort of in, invites you um, to take up the space inside the card that works for your mind, your imagination. Just like when we're doing a yoga pose, it's the, the pose is about the making a space for the, for the shape your body wants, wants to make inside of it. I was also reading that um, Kirsten, who I know is well familiar with the tarot, wrote in chat, what I love about her highness is that she seems to me to be completely unapologetic as are the sparks. Um, I like that. I think that's right on. Also, um, as for those of y'all who have downloaded the files, there are images of the Queen of Wands late, or the file later in that file. I will attempt to share those as well. Uh, and only one of these cards shows the queen more traditionally. She is the only queen that looks straight out of the card at the viewer. Um, traditionally, the other queens are like in profile or looking away. And this is the queen that just looks like directly at you, which I, I feel like that perspective, you, you get that perspective, right, of being unapologetic. Um, I was thinking about the third provocation, of course, particularly in terms of, of haunting um, this idea that there are stories that haunt us and, and probably those are the stories that we're refusing to tell. Those are the ones that are that are haunting us. Um, I feel like I've spent most of my professional career trying to get ahead of that by like giving myself away in my poems. Um, so I, I can't be haunted by those stories. Um, but, you know, more seriously, we poets talk about um, what we do, like we talk about poetry as an antenna, right? Or the act of writing a poem. Um, we, we talk about it in terms of a, an antenna, right? Just being open to all of the frequencies and, you know, receiving, which is pretty much what a wand does. It receives and transmits energy. So when I think about this provocation or all, or sorry, sparks, I used to call these provocations. It's new that I'm calling them sparks. So I have to catch myself. So these sparks, I think about them uh, you know, and often a wand is receiving fire too, right? So sparks makes a lot of sense. But um, when I think about the, what are the stories that tell you even as you refuse to tell them specifically, but also the other two sparks, I think about um, the wand as an antenna that's tuned to the world, but also tuned to our inner lives and specifically like the inner lives that we silence as we try to go about the business of everyday life, or maybe we don't think we're silencing them, right? Maybe it's, it's they get silenced or, or we allow them to be silenced. Uh, so I think a lot, especially with this third spark about what what is getting tuned in and tuned out by the wand. So, so what say maybe the wand is bringing from the outside world into yourself to like get some things unstuck or vice versa, what's the wand pulling out from inside of you and releasing into the world to unstick something in the world. Um, so as you can see, while these sparks are really intense, I, I to me, they're, they're very positive, right? Very sort of like transformational. Um, which is a witch, right? Like that's what a witch does. She receives, she transforms. Also, this queen is known for being very, very seductive. And that's also why she is often misunderstood. And I was thinking a lot about that, the idea of seduction as um, a way of operating in the world, a way of responding to this particular historical moment. And this is something I just started thinking about like yesterday. So it's not a fully formed thought. This is a, like a thought that has to like grab onto the chair or like her mother's legs to stand up. It can't stand up on its own. So I'm hoping that y'all will, you know, help me, help me to f help this thought find its legs, let's say. Uh, so, but this idea that um, there's a lot of like anger 
and rage and calls to activism and all of that is really necessary and important. But what if we bring seduction into the mix? Or like, what if that is like Queen of Wands, witchy poetry kind of superpower to bring that in? And Avni, I'm thinking a lot about you in this moment because I've really um, appreciated on Instagram how you're often talking about rage and love in the same phrase. Um, that, that, that idea of raging with love to protect one another, um, which isn't really seduction, but I feel like, you know, poets were so good at triangles. So what if we put like rage, love and seduction in a triangle and, you know, saw, saw how things circulated around, around that. Um, which brings me full circle to my editor at Spork, Richard Sykin. Um, this was in 2016, so a, a different, but I don't know, like same but different political climate. Um, and Richard was asked, uh, in our current political climate, what is something that brings you joy? Richard answered, Joy is such a startling word. I guess I've been aiming low, hoping for moments of occasional relief. I feel like I am, like we all are, being strong-armed into reaction and binary thought. I'm drawn to anything that can remind me of playfulness or multiplicity. I was watching a YouTube video on film editing yesterday, a little thing, a couple minutes long, and I found myself thinking about lateral movement, concurrent meanings, texture, atmosphere, the consequence of the frame. I don't know if I could call it joy, but I remembered that I had more strategies to understand the world than I was being encouraged to use and more agency to use them than I was allowing myself. And I don't really know what I think about joy. Um, in fact, I think joy is something I have a really hard time thinking about, but I do love this idea. And I think this is very Queens of Wansey that you have more strategies to understand the world than you're, or we all, right? We have more strategies to understand the world than we're being encouraged to use and more agency to use them than we are allowing ourselves. And the Queen of Wands is giving us permission um, to explore um, those strategies, one of which might be seduction. So as we get more specifically into the Queen of Wands, again, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and hopefully it goes better this time. Uh, and what I'm going to share with you is some of the Queen of Wands cards. These are also in the file in the chat and typically a court card is like a character. So it could be a person in your life. It could be a historical figure. Um, it could be an aspect of yourself, uh, one that maybe you express, one that maybe you don't, that's maybe more like a, a latent inner psychological aspect of you. Um, a lot of tarot readers say that when a court card appears, there is a voice speaking out and you must use your intuition to determine whose. So as you look at the Queen of Wands cards that um, I'm going to share and that are in the file, I want you to think about, like, use your intuition, who is speaking to you in these images. Um, and again, sort of having that idea in your mind will help as we move more specifically um, through the Queen of Wands. Okay, so I'm going to share the file one more time for those of y'all who maybe didn't see it. There it goes. And I think my screen sharing will work better this time. We'll see. Okay, so this first Queen of Wands is the most traditional of all of the three, except she's not looking straight out. Uh, so usually she's got the cat, she's got the wand, but she's sort of like staring straight out. This is from the Gorgon's Tarot. The second queen of wands is um, so more traditional, right? And that she's looking, for the most part, looking straight out of from the card rather than a wand. She's, you know, standing between two trees. She's holding, you know, like what a wand comes from, basically. Uh, this is from Christy Rhodes, uh, The Next World Tarot. And then the third one is from Emmy Brady's The Brady Tarot. I love this tarot and have been using it a lot lately because there are no humans whatsoever. Uh, and I'll have to look up actually, I don't know what that, uh, don't know what that bird is specifically. This is a, a prairie chicken on her throne, which is a plank of wood, a weathered plank of wood close to the earth. And th those other birds are males who are courting her.
So again, I'm going to turn it over to Nick and Avni, who are going to, um, Avni's going to connect these cards to the sparks, and then um, Nick's going to spark from there, and then it'll be your turn. Um, when I was thinking, when you originally shared uh, the three images, and I was thinking about them in relation to the provocations, I was trying to figure out like, uh, sorry, the sparks. The sparks are asking me to do one thing, and the cards are showing me kind of, as you were saying before, these these symbols uh, that are incredibly resilient, but reinterpreted across each uh, artist's vision, right? Um, and it reminded me so much of something that you do in the book, which is kind of weave the symbols throughout, but each time a symbol emerges, um, it morphs somehow or it changes in relation perhaps to its framing card. So that uh, that relationship between the spark and the card um, got me thinking about the sparks you shared and then these specific images. I don't know if, uh, if the sparks speak directly to the images, but what I like and in, in the way you kind of informed them this idea um, that they, they don't, they kind of electrify each other. Each other. That's the word that I kind of kept coming back to, the spark and uh, the, the card. They don't reflect, but they electrify. So then I'm, I'm thinking more around like the, uh, the dynamic exchange between those points. Um, and maybe for me, that's really where like, as you described that ex-wife quality, uh, I really enjoy the knowing, the power, and the transference that's happening between these two uh, maybe poles of the thought argument. So a way to kind of unthink out of that binary um, of you know joy versus joylessness or whatever is, uh, is electricity. What's it affording? What's it uh, taking away? What's it transmitting? Um, so that allows me to feel a little more active or actively involved in terms of shaping and receiving some of those imagery and those images. Mm -hmm. I could keep talking, so I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna. <laughs> That's so beautiful, it. though. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm turning it over to Nick. Yeah, so um, I mean, I think the reason I latched on to this um, spark about self help books and then being yourself was the crime to end all crimes. Um, I think, like, my mom actually sent me a, a picture of me in a Halloween costume at maybe like six or so. I was in some sort of like skeleton costume and I was making this like weird like funny face and I have no memory of being a kid who like made funny faces and like feel like I'm not silly in those sorts of ways now I've been trying to do like solo dance parties during quarantine in my house and like I can only do it with my blinds closed and like knowing that I'm here by myself right and so like I've been thinking a lot about the ways that like what is my sort of baby Aries, Aries self that like wanted to be really impulsive and silly and like funny that got like dimmed somehow along the way. So I feel like part of what I'm trying to do now at 35 is like figure out how to get back there. Um, and so like, I think that that's what, that's what that is making me think about a lot, right? Like trying to get back to that sort of spark that I feel like got covered up over time. Um, and like thinking about the, the queen of wands as like a sort of uh, a symbol that like, this is a good day to be really practicing this or sort of leaning really fully into this work or um, what, what could the queen of wands tell me? about how to get back to that place or like embody that kind of like childlike uh, spark in uh, an adult kind of form, something like that. I feel like that really dovetails nicely with um, how I identify with Jacqueline Lamba, but like in an opposite way. So um, for those of y'all out there, I'm mindful of time. And I had a few things I wanted to say about Jacqueline Lamba and ex-wives and the Queen of Wands, but I also want to open it up for someone to derail me and ask me to talk about something else if you have a spark, right, of your own. So um, Avni is going to be watching the chat. So if you've got it, like I'm totally open to be derailed. Otherwise, I'm going to talk about Jacqueline Lamba and ex-wives. So as I think, is anyone out there familiar with Jacqueline Lamba? Perfect. That was what I hoped. So I only learned about her accidentally recently um, via Mary Cause, who, you know, is one of the one of the thinkers, scholars who has curated much of um, surrealism for us and then um, compiled several anthologies. And so in one of these anthologies, she talks about Mary Cause, about how she was obsessed with Andre Breton. And she thought at a certain point, well, I should meet the ex-wife. 
So she goes out in search of the ex-wife. Uh, and much of what we now know about Jacqueline Lamba is due to Mary Cause going out in search of the ex-wife. Uh, and I'm just going to give you like a brief overview of Jacqueline Lamba's life. I myself am an ex-wife. I think that the ex-wife is a subject position that um, is very common, but also very misunderstood, not talked about a lot, that it, it usually gets poor treatment. And I'm thinking specifically, like I recently watched much to my dismay, the new adaptation of Rebecca, Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca on Netflix. And, you know, it's just like, as the ex-wife, Rebecca is just vilified, right? So I feel like it's like stepmother, ex-wife kind of go in this same like evil witch kind of villain category. And, and rarely do they get to have their own voices, especially if we think about the history um, of men who were doing all of this like outward facing public work and the women maybe are artists in their own right, but not being recognized and not being remembered, right? So there's a lack um, of a historical record there. So, okay, Jacqueline. So when I think also about Jacqueline Lamba, I'm thinking about this idea that if for me, the queen of wands represents true independence of mind, no matter what came before, then how did she get there? What was the what that came before? Um, so Nick, you know, while you're thinking backwards to like reclaiming something from childhood, I think I'm thinking forwards, right? To like, what is, you know, sort of the work, the struggles, the challenges you're going through now? Like, where are you maybe arriving? Um, okay, so Jacqueline, Jacqueline Lamba, um, when she was born, her parents already had a daughter. Um, this was the early 1900s. They did not want another daughter. They very much wanted a boy. Uh, so they treated her as a tomboy. They called her a garçon monk, mank. They've been practicing French all day, but you probably can't tell. So they, they called her a garçon mank, which in French means incomplete boy. Uh, they referred to her as Jacko. They cropped her hair. They dressed her in boys' clothes. At 10, she goes to a boarding school for girls. And when prospective families come to visit, she gets paraded out as the typical child because already she's becoming a very beautiful girl with like golden curls, large hazel eyes, rosy cheeks. In her late teen, oh, and hang on. I, um, so if you look to the, I think it's the eighth page in the file that I shared with you, you can see a self portrait that she, um, did when she was 17. And so you can see in this self-portrait that she's really like, there's this sense of um, gender body dysmorphia, right? Being disconnected from like the, the inner and the outer expression, being disconnected um, from themselves. And hang on, I'm trying to like fix whatever happened the last time I shared my screen with you. Okay, so you can see it now. This is, um, this is a self-portrait that she did at 17. Three years later, so she's in her early 20s, she's a struggling uh, art student studying to be a painter in Paris. And she's paying the rent, paying her way through school, basically as a mermaid. So at the time there at the Coliseum, there were nude swimmers in this underground tank. Um, and that was, the job that was paying the rent. Uh, so she was performing as a mermaid and was said to have such an extraordinary body that she looked better naked than dressed. Um, as we move in, and so it's at this point that she meets um, Breton. Uh, she intentionally uh, arranged, he thinks it's an accidental meeting. She intentionally arranges it. He immediately is like head over heels in love with her. For those of y'all who are familiar with his, um, I guess we would call it a chapbook now, Mad Love. He's writing about Jacqueline Lamba. She inspired that book. Um, so in Mad Love, he says many times, this was so horrifying to me to read because this in Breton's perspective is like the, the, the highest form of praise. He writes many times, I shall reinvent you for me. Uh, and Lamba later says, you know, he saw in me what he wanted to see. He didn't really see me. Um, and of course, the surrealists are very famous for wanting muses, right? And it was much more aesthetic to introduce her as a mermaid and a muse as opposed to a struggling painter. So that's what he did. She was never recognized as a painter in her own right by Breton. Um, so throughout her 20s and 30s, she's treated as a muse, a trouvelle, which is a found object that inspires in French. 
Um, in her mid thirties to mid fifties, she gets divorced twice. Um, once from Breton, who says, I will destroy you when she asks for a divorce. And this next picture, hopefully my screen is changing for you. Um, this is, uh, she was really good friends with Frida Kahlo because they really commiserated over the status that they were relegated to as female artists at this time. And so this um, painting is called The Bride That Becomes Frightened When She Sees Life open. Uh, and so Callow painted this when Lamba was contemplating divorce from Breton. And you can see this is like Lamba in the background, this kind of surrealist doll ornament looking on the seductive fruits of life, trying to choose freedom, but not knowing how to escape her gilded cage. Uh, so she gets married again and to another painter, David Hare. Um, ends up leaving him after um, being introduced at a party as his wife and the person responding, which one? Uh, so by the time she's in her 60s, she's finally on her own. She's back in Paris. Um, she's painting and she says that she painted surrealism to please Breton and expressionism to please David Hare. But now around like 67, she's painting for herself. Um, and at the time she wrote, being alone did not mean my lack of desire to meet neither beings nor friends, but to be inhabited by oneself, either to love or to create. Uh, I find this story like really optimistic actually, and really inspiring. And I'm grateful to have her as a companion um, and, and sort of like the opportunity the Queen of Wands afforded, right? For me to now have this relationship with this woman. Um, many of y'all out there are familiar with those happy accidents that a life of poetry, a life of art affords. Uh, the last picture there, for those of y'all who are looking at the file on your own is a picture of Calo and um, Lamba who were really good friends. And I'm gonna end it there because we're out of time. I feel like I should maybe have had a better moral to that story. Maybe one of y'all can provide me a moral to my own story. Um, I'm gonna answer a question and Avni's gonna ask me or one's gonna appear in the chat and that will that will be the moral to the story. So the pressure's on Avni or one of y'all perhaps appropriately. <laughs> Well, I'm going to ask um, a question that I know you don't like, but I love asking. Um, <laughs> so uh, this, my question is, what do you love about these poems? Um, and I ask that because I know how much I love, like what I love in these poems and what I imagine readers to fall in love with. Um, but I think that would be a really nice bridge uh, to know what it is you love in the poems themselves. One thing in three minutes for now just one um this book taught me taught me taught me i think this book is teaching me things i don't know what yet so i'm not going to follow that rabbit hole uh this book took me 10 years to write from start to finish so um there's something in that you know, like spending that long with the idea with, with the poems. So we have a really intimate relationship that I think on the one hand is really beautiful, but on the other makes it very difficult for me to talk about these poems. When I do, or I try to think about the quality perhaps of that intimacy, this is my first book I would say where I really was writing in character. Liberty of course is related to me but she's not me. Uh, so that's maybe the, the happiest thing for me in this book is I, I created a character and I've been living with her for a decade now and she's real and surprising and contradictory. And every time I read these poems, I get to spend some time with her. I was hoping you would say something about Liberty um, because I think, um, you don't, I mean, if you read the book and I strongly encourage everyone to go get their own copy if they don't have one already from Bookstore One or Spork Press. Um, I, I think uh, what's so cool is that 
this is this is a book that demonstrates that it changes a person like the tarot changes you right and there's there's some shift and changing happening and you don't spend 10 years with something and remain the same person so i really appreciated seeing all of the levels and layers play against one another and seeing kind of that decade encapsulated through this deck um it's a really really generous gift thank you very much for sharing it with us emily thank you and i just want to thank um Heidi just shared something in chat. So I just wanted to acknowledge it and thank Heidi for participating. Um, so Heidi wrote the crime of being yourself, depression that invites either re-upping to be yourself as you are or transformation to your next self. Um, what would the queen of wands do? And which I think is like a really great question, right? Like what would the queen of wands do? Um, yes, my costume, that was the moral of the story. So um, I've seen some good ideas in chat. One is the mother of feathers. Somebody else said, um, we need to see more of your outfit. There's not that much more to see. So that's the whole outfit. Um, mother of feathers is great and I might roll with it next time. Um, I maybe should just tell y'all, huh? I don't think anyone's gonna guess. So I think I'm a character in Josh Whedon's Firefly, his like cowboy Western science fiction television series from the 90s that got canceled after three seasons. So I'm not a character that actually appears on the show. I'm a character that they planned to incorporate later, but then Firefly got canceled too soon. <laughs> So I think that's why I'm the only person who has any idea. Um, for those of y'all who would like a signed copy of the book, because um, I know most of y'all out there, yes, thank you, Natalie. Um, we'll all make it happen, right? So you can also get, if you want a signed copy of my book, you can get it from me, along with some kind of um, pleasantly ominous postcard. So if that's the case, holler at me and I'll make it happen. Um, thank you all. It's so, so good to spend some time to see all of your faces. I miss all of y'all so much. This is maybe one of my favorite book launches ever. Well, and this is Georgia again. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. It was, it was fun. It was lovely. It was instructive for me as I sat and watched and enjoyed. So thank you. And, uh, by the way, as someone had put in the chat, how do we get the book? I know Emily had mentioned you could get it from her, but there is a link in the chat if you want a direct link to buy it from, from bookstore number one. It's the first item in the chat, so you have to scroll up to the top. And hang on, we'll drop the link again, but two things, because we all should support local businesses. So y'all ship, right, Georgia? Yeah, so bookstore one ships, but also for those of y'all in Oregon, um, my book is in a hip boutique in downtown Portland. So if you find yourself in Portland, you can go to a cool little shop and get a copy too. So we'll make sure to get all of that information out to folks. Okay. All right. Thank you for coming. And, and a round of applause for our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Avni. Thank you, Nick. Good night. Thanks, everyone.